Well, good morning. And welcome to all of you who are joining us online. And those of you who are meeting here at Central Campus, along with those of you who are meeting at one of our other campuses in Airdrie, in Bridgeland, South Calgary, and the amazing campus that I have the honor and privilege of leading, our Bears Paw Campus, who better be cheering louder than ever over there at this very moment. You know, we're at church and so we're friendly. So wherever you're gathering, here at Central or at another campus, why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, wow, you look amazing this morning. <laughs> well, this past week, Pastor Henry got hit with the flu bug and so... Pastor Kent asked if I would preach this weekend, and he said, Mike, you'll do great. Just keep it biblical, short, and interesting. <laughs> so, to keep it interesting, I've decided to preach through the Song of Solomon verse by verse in 25 minutes flat. You're welcome. Here we go. You guys ready? Let's go. I'm kidding, of course. That would be something, though. You know, there are two times a year when most people take some time to reflect on their lives and their values and contemplate making changes to their schedule. And those two times are typically the beginning of the new year in January and the beginning of the school year in September or right about now. And some people will even make resolutions during these times. For example, this going into the summer, I resolved to lose 10 pounds and I'm Pleased to report to you, I've made really good progress. I only have about 20 pounds to go. <laughs> but seriously, you know, September is one of those times some people will stop and reflect on the deeper and more serious questions of life. Like, what is the mission of my life? What is the main thing that I'm giving my life to? And when it's all said and done, what will matter the most to God and to me? And in light of all this, are there any changes that I need to make to my priorities in my schedule? Every once in a while, it is critically important we stop and think about our answers to these questions because how you answer these questions will affect everything in your life, including the direction of your life, your marriage, your family, your values, your finances, and your calendar, to name just a few. Everything hinges on who or what you are going to trust and give your life to. Now, the Apostle Paul was crystal clear what his purpose and mission was. In Philippians 1.21, he said, For to me, to live is Christ. Moses' disciple Joshua boldly declared, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Now whether you are a Christ follower or not, single or married, with kids, without kids, I invite you to do something this morning that may make you a bit uncomfortable. And that is to have an honest look at your life in light of scripture and be honest about what you are really pursuing in life. Let me ask you, how would those who know you best answer this question about you? For you to live is what? As they look at your life, your passions, your priorities, your schedule, how do you think they would answer this question? In fact, here's a challenge. Ask them sometime. And when they share it with you, don't be defensive, just receive the feedback graciously and assess whether their feedback aligns at all with what you believe you are living for and what the scriptures say you should be pursuing in life. And then go to the Lord and ask him, what are you saying to me? And what do you want me to do about it? You know, an exercise like this can be maybe a little upsetting and painful, but it is so important for us 
to think about because let's face it, the years go by so quickly. Before we know it, 10, 20, 30 years have passed. Regardless of your age, there is no greater time than now to do this. The Bible says we have no guarantee we will live to even see tomorrow. You know, the psalmist said, show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. Each man's life is but a breath. You see, the psalmist is saying every single day counts. And how we spend each day adds up to the sum total of what your life will become. One person put it this way, your calendar shouldn't be a list of things you want to get done. No, it should be a list of the things you want to become. So who are you becoming? To help us determine who or what we are really pursuing in life, we're going to learn today from the life of Joshua. So if you are physically able, would you stand with me as we read out loud together a portion of Joshua 24, starting in verse 14. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord." Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for Joshua's conviction here. Teach us, Lord, what he meant in his declaration and help us learn to evaluate our own lives today and what we are really living for. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now, before Joshua declared to his people the words that we just read together, he asked the leaders of the nation to gather, and he let them know that he would soon die. And his greatest concern before he died was not himself, but his people and their relationship with the Lord. And so, like a loving father, he gave them his final advice on how to live with no regret and receive all God had for them and their families. He challenged them to fear the Lord and to follow him. But it was up to them to choose who or what they will worship and serve. And then he shared his own convictions saying, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Now to serve the Lord means to worship the Lord and to love and pursue him above all else. And so Joshua challenged his people to make pursuing and living for the Lord the main thing in their life and family. And so the question I want to address in this message is, how do we consistently pursue a God-centered life and home? Well, first of all, if we want to consistently pursue a God-centered life and home, we need to remember and celebrate daily who God is and what he has done. You know, just prior to the Israelites entering the promised land, Moses described the promised land in Deuteronomy 6 and 11 as a flourishing land filled with incredible abundance. But then in Deuteronomy 6, verse 11 to 12, Moses added this. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt out of the land of slavery. And see, Joshua remembered Moses saying this. He knew 
This luscious land had the capacity to draw Israel's eyes away from God, to tempt and seduce them to forget the God who made it possible for them to be there in the first place. And so his fi- in his final words to the people, we read here in Joshua 24 that the first thing Joshua does is remind them of who God is and what he has done. He highlights God's sovereign grace to them. Just look back at verse three. It says, I took your father Abraham. This is God speaking. He said, I took your father Abraham and led him throughout Canaan. I gave him Isaac. And to Isaac, I gave Jacob. In verse five, then I sent Moses and Aaron and I afflicted the Egyptians by what I did. And I brought you out. In verse eight, I brought you to the land of the Amorites and I gave them into your hands. And on and on it goes, 21 times. In verse three to 13, Joshua reminds the people that everything they are and everything they have is from his hand and his grace. So why does Joshua spend 11 verses doing this? to remind the people that God can be trusted, to remember whose they are and who brought them this far, that in all things, no matter what comes their way, in the good times, the bad times, God can be trusted. And church, this is instructive to us today. The God who was faithful then will be faithful now. So how can we grow in our trust in God? Well, the primary way to know God and to remember what he has done is to read about him in the Bible and to hear the word taught in worship services like this and to study and reflect on it and even memorize it daily. You know, the word remember is used 352 times in scripture. Do you ever wonder why? Because God knows that we tend to get a little bit distracted and forget who created us and gave us breath. To forget whose hand of provision and grace has been on our lives. He knows at times we have spiritual amnesia and give our lives to the temporary things of earth. Church, don't miss this. The reason so many people, including many Christians, really don't know God is because they don't read and study their Bible. And unless we read the scriptures daily, spiritual amnesia often sets in and we lose God's perspective within a few days. It's that quick. And Jesus affirms this. And Jesus says in Matthew 6, verse 11, Give us this day our monthly bread. No, give us this day our weekly bread. No, give us this day our daily bread. Daily bread. Jesus says monthly isn't enough. Weekly isn't enough. We need his truth to saturate our minds daily. No, I'll never forget when I was in college, I confessed to a friend of mine that I just didn't have time to be in God's word on a daily basis. I assured him it was important to me. And I was anticipating him responding with encouraging, comforting words like, it's okay, Mike. God knows your heart. You know, he's gracious, he's merciful. He understands how busy you are. You have a lot going on. He knows how stressed you are. But to my surprise, he said, Mike, I think you're simply making excuses and need to confess that the reason you aren't making time for the Lord is because deep down, you feel you really don't need God or to know his truth. We are no longer friends. I'm just kidding. But you know, he challenged me that what I said was important wasn't lining up 
with the way I was living and that I was actually building my life on something other than the Lord. And I can honestly say that when I made the decision to match what I said I believed with what I did, I, and I began daily spending time with, in God's word and sharing my heart with him in prayer, it began to transform my life and our family and our values and our calendar. And so first of all, if we want to consistently pursue a God-centered life and home, then we need to remember and celebrate daily who God is and what he has done. And secondly, we need to intentionally impress our faith on our children and or our spiritual children. Now Joshua says in verse 15, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And that doesn't just happen. Joshua had to be intentional and lead the way. In Deuteronomy 6, verse 7, Moses challenges parents to impress their faith in God on their children. He says, talk about your faith in God when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. You know, this is a word for parents, but in many ways, a word for all of us as believers. Anyone who is a spiritual parent to someone, whether young or old, or anyone who is mentoring and discipling people who look to them for guidance. Which brings us back to a sobering question. When your children, or those who look to you for spiritual direction, when they look at your life, what do they see? For you to live is what? For daddy to live is what? For mommy to live is what? You know, Joshua and Moses are calling us to saturate our life with the Lord. And that means that whatever you want to be important to your children needs to be important to you. If you want the word of God to be precious to your children, if you want Jesus to be precious to your children, if you want prayer to be precious to your children, if you want loving others selflessly to be precious to your children, then it needs to be important to you. And the primary way they will know that these things are precious to you is through your life. When you read the scriptures daily to them and teach them what it means, when you regularly tell them of your love for Jesus and what your faith in Jesus means to you, and when you pray with them often, they will quickly realize how important Jesus and his word is to you. When you serve together as a family or a missional community group or at church or in your neighborhood, when they see you welcoming people into your home, even when you're really tired, or helping a neighbor, a friend, or a coworker, they will quickly learn what it means to follow Jesus. Parents, you do not have the power to determine whether or not your children believe in God and trust him. But if you profess to be Christ followers, you do have the power and ability to lead them and teach them about the God you know and love. You can't save your children. The children's pastor or youth pastor can't save your children. They can help in many ways and they do. But only the Lord can save your children. However, you can intentionally cultivate an environment in your home where you teach them and show them about the Lord who has saved your life. But here's the thing, parents. Are you making time for this? Is this showing up in your calendar? Is this one of the main things you are intentionally pursuing? 
Or are you relying solely on the church or children's ministry or youth group to do that? These ministries are important, but it's not enough. The Bible says that you are the primary influence in your child's life. You see, if we don't want to have any regrets, we need to be brutally honest with ourselves and ask, what do we need to do more of and what do we need to do less of? And then pulling out our calendar, we need to make hard decisions, taking out the things that really won't matter to us in the end and putting in the things that will. According to Joshua, this is foundational to the house your family is built on, foundational to you as a person. And it doesn't matter what everyone else does. It's their choice. This is your choice. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then thirdly and finally, if we want to pursue a God-centered life and home, we will need to love and serve the Lord with all faithfulness. In verse 14 and 15, it says this, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Now in Joshua's final words here, he says the most important decision in life that you will ever make as a person, as a parent, as a coach, as a mentor, is who you are going to serve. Who you are going to trust and give your life to. You see, who we serve is a reflection of who we trust in. Whatever choices you are making in life will tell you who you are serving and trusting in. Now, I'm sure that most of us here who call ourselves Christians, we join Joshua in saying, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Yeah, yeah. And yet I'm wondering if the daily decisions we're making reflect that desire. You know, researcher George Barna discovered that in a typical week, fewer than 10% of parents who regularly attend church with their kids read the Bible together, pray together, other than at mealtimes, or serve together as a family unit. Research also discovered that only 58% of Christian parents are very concerned that their children will stay true to their faith when they leave the home. Research found that the vast majority of churchgoers give less than 2% of their money toward charity and the church's mission and ministry, whereas Costs related to sports, fitness, recreation, and vacations are non-negotiable. Now what this research is saying is that faith doesn't seem to be something that saturates our lives. It's just something that we try to squeeze into an already overcrowded schedule and budget. But the Bible teaches us that faith is not meant to be just a piece of our lives. It's meant to be the very center, the core of who we are that directs everything else, the foundation upon which everything else is built. You know, the phrase fear the Lord that Joshua uses here, it means to respect and honor the Lord with your whole life. It means that God is your first love. And not just in your talk, but in your daily walk. You know, it's impossible to pass on to anyone, including our children, a value or a principle that we do not personally live out. Nothing happens through us that isn't happening to us. We can say all we want about how much we love Jesus, but if our love for him doesn't regularly flow out of our lives daily, other people and children will conclude otherwise. So church, Live the life you believe in. To give and serve that which you say you're committed to. For example, ask yourself this question. Are you engaged in introducing people to Jesus? 
at home, at work, at school, with boldness? Are we engaged in helping others know God deeper? Students in junior high and senior high or young adults attending college or university, do you know that God has placed you in your school for such a time as this to be his hands and his feet and his voice to those around you? And in the church, are you shepherding and encouraging those younger than you who look up to you? You know, I'm told that though we have space at all of our campuses, that we are still turning children and youth away because we do not have enough volunteers. You know, those who are working. Are you sincerely asking the Lord to show you opportunities to love others or have spiritual conversations with others in your workplace? Those who sit next to you or work next to you every single day? Kids, students, parents, those of you participating in sports teams. Now, I love sports and extracurricular activities. You're looking at a lifetime hockey player, volleyball player, and grade seven ping pong city champion, okay? I love sports, all right? <laughs> but whether you're involved on a sports team or gymnastics or karate or dance, do you see these as just fun things your kids love? Or do you see that these are great ministry opportunities to love and serve God and others? I mean, do you pray with your kids before and after they win or lose and look for opportunities to have spiritual conversations in the stands or in the locker room? Adults, are we praying with and encouraging and challenging each other in our community groups to grow in our walk with the Lord and our care and concern for one another and reaching out to the lost in our neighborhoods? Or would we have to admit our lives are far too absorbed with lesser earthly things? Church, you will never regret pursuing the Lord and living for him the closer you and Jesus become, the more your heart will change and will live for the eternal things that truly matter. You know, the, whole, the old uh, hymn rings true. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Can we just sing that together here at Central? And if you're at another campus or if you're at home watching online, let's just sing that together. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strange, leading in the light of his glory and grace. And Joshua said, make your choice. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. In closing, what does Jesus say about all of this? In Matthew chapter seven, when Jesus is closing his Sermon on the Mount, he gives us an example of two lives built on very different foundations. And each one made a choice. And he said this, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. 
But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. So how strong is your house? How strong is your trust in God? What kind of material are you building your life on? You have a choice. Have you tried building on both God and money? Jesus said you can't. You can't serve both God and money. It's impossible. It's sinking sand. Have you tried building your life on success or what people think of you? If you have, you will be greatly disappointed one day. Both are sinking sand. Have you tried building on a life of ease, comfort, security, pleasure, fun? It's sinking sand. Have you tried building a li on a life just going through the motions and rituals of your faith? It's sinking sand. Have you tried building your life on an earthly relationship? It's sinking sand. Now please understand, most of these things are not wrong in themselves. But church, when that becomes the focus and the passion of our lives, they are sinking sand. Because in pursuing these lesser things of life, we will have missed the very reason that God put us here for such a time as this. And our house and our life will come crashing down one day. Jesus says there's only one way to build a foundation that is strong, could hold up to anything that comes our way. Anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. So I once again, I ask you, as you honestly examine your life and your daily choices for you to live is what? And if your answer to that statement is the Lord, then may you draw a line in the sand today that he is Lord of your time and the Lord of your money. That he is the Lord of your thoughts and the Lord of your desires. He is the Lord of your job and the Lord of your relationships. He's the Lord of your family and the Lord of your life. And he is the Lord of your heart and the Lord of your mission. May it be so for the glory of God. Let's stand together. Let's just bow our heads and close our eyes and, and let's ask those two questions. Lord, what are you saying to me? And what are you asking me to do about it? Joshua said, choose this day whom you will serve. This day, not next week, this day. Throw away your counterfeit gods that this world pursues and choose this day. 
to pursue a life of eternal significance in serving God. And your house, your life will be built on a firm foundation with Jesus Christ as the cornerstone. Your decision today could impact generations after you, but it starts this day. So may this next song that we sing be your declaration, your choice, to build your life on what truly matters.